Welcome back, brothers and sisters. This is Seed Wars number 37. The title of this lecture series is The Red Haired Giants. And we're going to get into some really interesting scripture. And we're going to look at some case studies around the globe of these red haired Nephilim giants. And uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it. We're going to get into some really controversial topics, too, about uh, predestination and the serpent seed line and things of that nature. So I hope that you uh, that you enjoy that. Uh, before I go forward, I wanted to mention that I recently posted four lecture series called The Strong Delusion on Rumble.com. This is a powerful series uh, that's pretty fully encapsulating of the Second Thessalonians 2, the final strong delusion with the cosmic Christ and the final Antichrist system that comes to deceive humanity with the extraterrestrials and the fallen ones, the, the stars who fall from heaven onto earth. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't choose to put it on this platform because I get into some pretty heavy stuff, and in the past I've always gotten busted on YouTube. So I just I posted it on Rumble, and uh, I'll leave a link in the description box on this video to that platform. There's two ways you can get to it. You can either go to the description box of this very video you're listening to now, and there'll be a link that takes you to the first one. Uh, or you can just go to rumble.com and type in, in the search engine, type in Seed Wars. All one word, S-E-E-D-W-A-R-S, -E -E Seed Wars. And it'll take you to my channel, and you'll see the last four videos. There's some other good videos on there as well. But the last four is the series on um, the strong delusion. And uh, they're, they're, in my opinion, they're definitely worth watching. Uh, they get into modern day times, where we're at, everything that we've just walked through for the past three years, and what's the end game, folks. And so um, now that I've been able to get that off my plate, um, I can get back to looking at the scripture through the lens of the Proto-Evangelium of the seed of the woman versus the seed of the serpent. And that's what we're going to look to do on the next three or four lectures with the red-haired giants. Now, for those of you who've uh, followed any of my videos, you understand that the Days of Noah series and the Seed War series have been based on a couple of pivotal verses in the Old Testament. The first, of course, is the first prophecy in the Bible, referred to as the Proto-Evangelium of Genesis 3.15. And it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So we have to understand that this is the first prophecy of the coming of Jesus Christ. This is actually, this verse took place in the Garden of Eden. It was immediately after Adam and Eve had partaken of the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge and evil, uh, the knowledge of good and evil. And now God is in the garden and he's literally addressing Satan, the, the, the serpent, Adam and Eve. And he tells Satan, I will put in an enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Now this word seed is the word Zara and it means semen or posterity that which produces a bloodline or a, a genealogical record. So even though many people over the course of time have tried to spiritualize this verse, we can see that it's a physical thing, that there, are, there is a battle between two seed lines going forward. The first seed line, of course, is, is God's seed line. It's what he created in the garden. He had a beautiful creation story where he took the clay of the earth and he packed it together and he made the man, Adam. And then he breathed through his nostrils the living spirit. He put the essence of a man into the vessel. And when the spirit and the flesh came together, 
that created the soul, which is the mind, the will, and the emotions of Adam. And at that moment, Adam became a tripartite man. And then God did the first surgery. He put Adam to sleep, and he took the bones from Adam's rib. And in essence, he cloned Adam by making an exact carbon copy replica of him, only in the female version as the person of Eve. And so now you have Adam and Eve. <clears throat> they have a perfect genome created by God. And there's been no corruption to them. And we understand that they don't have any parents or grandparents or anybody who could have contributed any uh, fallen genetic traits. So God made them perfect in his own image and in his own likeness. And he said, be fruitful and multiply. And they did. And then, of course, we understand that the fall came and mankind was cast out of the garden. But nonetheless, that remained God's original creation, Adam and Eve. And as they proceeded forward, we see the second seed light come about. Now, I believe that the second seed line may have well come in Genesis 3, and we'll look at that later. But for a certain, the corruption came three chapters later in Genesis 6, when the fallen angels, the Elohim, they descended down upon earth, and they took the daughters of men, and they slept with them, and they created a genetic hybrid strain known as the Nephilim. And so at this point in time, you now have two seeds on planet Earth. This is way back in the Genesis account before the flood. You have the Adamic race, the human race that God made in his own image, his own likeness, Adam and Eve and all of their progenitors. And then you have the fallen angels who've come in and they've genetically modified humans by creating the Nephilim. And we now have this hybrid seed who are working in tandem with the original seed. And just as the prophecy says, God says, I will put enmity between these two seeds. These two seeds are going to battle each other going forward. All the way through the scripture, all the way through the Old Testament, and even through the New Testament. <clears throat> And I even believe that the Antichrist will be a genetically modified hybrid man who has fallen angelic DNA within his person. And that he will continue to be the fulfillment of this enmity between the two seed lines. Now, the Proto-Evangelium also declares that he, capital he, shall bruise your head, serpent but you shall bruise his heel. This is the first prophecy of the coming of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus is a descendant of God's race of Adam and Eve, of the Adamic race. He was made in the likeness of a man, and he lived up to the full measure of the law. He had no sin in him. He was born without the sin nature, and he was able to fulfill the scriptures, and through his death, burial, and resurrection, he was able to overcome the law of sin and death. And so this is how he bruises the serpent's head, by destroying sin and death. But the serpent was able to bruise his heel because, as we know, the Messiah had to go through great turmoil in fulfilling this verse. And so this is the Proto-Evangelium. Now, the second pivotal verse that we've already started to review is Genesis 6. This is really where that, that second cursed hybrid seed line gains its, its, its footing. It says that there were giants on the earth in those days and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. The same became the mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So it's very clear here that there were the giants on the earth in the pre-flood days. That's, we cannot argue that. 
That is just a reality. There were giants on the earth at that time. But not only in the pre-flood world, but also after that. In the post-flood world, there were giants. And we see this throughout the Old Testament, whether it be Goliath, or even here, like in Numbers 13, where Moses is heading into the Promised Land, and he understands that there's rumors that there's these giants living there. And he commissions his two best men, Joshua and Caleb, to sneak into the Promised Land and to spy it out. And after 40 days, they come back and they tell Moses, they say, look, we saw the giants there. And they list off all the different breeds of Nephilim. There were the Amalekites and the Hittites and the Jebusites and, and the Amorites. And we even saw the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And by the way, the word giants used in Numbers 13 is the same giants that was used in Genesis 6, the Nephilim. And so we know that these giants after the flood are direct ancestral descendants of the pre-flood Nephilim. Now, we understand that when these fallen angels descended down from the heavens, that they descended onto Mount Hermon, the highest mountain in the Middle East region. Now, they descended from on high, from the heavens. Today, we would call that outer space, where the celestial bodies are, the, the atmosphere, or the firmament, or whatever terminology you want to use, they came from out there. The same way that you might say extraterrestrials would come today. And we don't have an exact understanding on how they came down. Many people visualize them flying down with their, with their wings. But there are many ancient texts like the Vedic texts that say that they came down in the Vimanas and these, these uh, technological uh, aerial craft. And so we have to understand that the Elohim, these fallen angels, they had access to technology. And they may have descended down in these uh, aerial vehicles and they presented themselves like gods. And then they took the women from the daughters of men and they took them illegally. It says that they took them as wives, which is an important detail we'll cover in a moment. They took them as wives, but God did not recognize that as a legal union. Because angels were never meant to procreate with the humans. But nonetheless, they found a way to take on physical embodiment. And they became incorporeal. And they were able to lust after the women. And in doing so... They contributed their fallen angelic DNA into the human DNA. And they created these 50-50 half-human, half-angel hybrids known as the Nephilim. And these Nephilim were not made in the image and likeness of God the way Adam and Eve were. And God didn't breathe this life-giving spirit into these entities. But rather they had a demonic spirit living inside of them. And you could, you could visualize them being almost like this entity I have over here on the right. They have a lot of overlapping human qualities, but they're not fully human. And not only have they been physically contaminated with their genome, but they've been spiritually contaminated with this demonic spirit that's indwelling them. And this demonic spirit is a satanic spirit that wants to make war with the Adamic peoples and wants to make war with everything that is from God. And so they begin this grand master hybridization program on the planet where not only are they interbreeding with the women, but they're also mixing one species of animal with another in order to provoke the Lord. And so when you fast forward hundreds and hundreds of years, the earth becomes completely full of these genetic abominations. And that's why it says later in Genesis 6 that men's hearts were only evil continually. <clears throat> and the Bible is not talking about men like Adam and Eve, but it's talking about these hybrid men. Because we must understand that the Bible refers to these Nephilim as men. Just as it says in Genesis 6, 
These were the mighty men of old, men of renown. And so when people read these verses, they think that this is talking about regular human beings. But in reality, God is looking down and he's referencing these hybrids as men because they are a type of man. They're just not fully human. And as this abomination continues on, these hybrids are, are invested in every kind of sinful condition possible. They want to eat the human beings, and, and this is the beginning of cannibalism. And they want to drink the blood and try and consume the soul power from their victims so that they can become stronger. And they initiate all of the idolatry. And as it says in the book of Enoch, these angels have also taught men how to mix roots and herbs to place people under a spell and to put people under enchantments. And they use the ancient pharmacia to seduce people. And they teach them uh, metals and, and war and how to make weapons. And um, they teach them uh, about astrology and astronomy and the movement of the star systems and, and the winter and summer solstice and, and all of the different things that would go on to completely corrupt all of humanity. But Noah was a righteous man and pure in his generations. And it appears that Noah and his immediate descendants are the only Adamic peoples left on the planet who haven't been corrupted, along with just a few of the animals who were still made according to their original creation account back in Genesis. And so eventually God realizes or decides in his omnipotence that he needs to create the great reset and level the playing field. And so he takes the pure genealogy of Adam and, or of uh, Noah and his family and he places them on the boat along with male and female animals who were still made after their own image and their own likeness and had not been genetically corrupted. And then he hits the reset button and he floods the whole thing. And so the, the, the ark is basically a DNA preservation capsule of everything that God had already made that he felt was good and everything that the devil had genetically corrupted he wiped off the map and when he killed all of these nephilim giants they released all of their demonic spirits and those demonic spirits have remained on the earth ever since that period and they're the same powers and principalities that are going to try and usher in the final days and so understanding that in the last days the ultimate goal of these fallen angelic beings and these demonic spirits is that they want to bring about a reenactment of Genesis 6. They want to genetically contaminate all flesh on earth and they want to take the human race and they want to try and deceive the human race into receiving the genetic modification of the fallen serpent seed hybrid Nephilim DNA so that they're no longer made in God's image and they're now being adopted into this serpent seed bloodline. And the, the, the big issue with this is Jesus Christ did not die on the cross and resurrect so that he could save this hybrid abomination strain. He only came to die for humanity. And so it's important that people understand that if they, if they receive the mark of the beast and they become genetically modified and they're no longer fully human, they're no longer made in Adam's image, they're no longer a son and daughter of Adam, that they're no longer proper fitting, a, a proper dwelling place for the Holy Spirit, they cannot be born again, they cannot have their sins absolved through the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and they are no longer offered eternal salvation. And that's why it's very important that people understand these things. And it's very important that they receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And it's very important that they remain human. Now, under that context, I'd like to proceed forward with this study on the red-haired giants. And it's, it's a really interesting study. And we're going to look at a couple of different accounts. Now, the, one, the first account are the red-haired giants of ancient Nevada on the west coast of the United States. 
according to a lot of ancient Indian Native American uh, legends, there were giants living in the caves of Lovelock and Winnemucca, Nevada. And there have been a lot of uh, different people who've written literature on this. And it, it's, a, it's a pretty fascinating account. So according to the Paiute Indians, these red-haired giants were named Sitika, which means the tool eaters. And the chief, Chief Winnemucca, who they named the city after in Nevada, Winnemucca, Nevada, and Lovelock, Nevada. The chief's daughter, Sarah, who can be seen over here on the right, she wrote a book describing what she referred to as a tribe of barbarians who would literally kill her people and eat them. And eventually the Indians decided to make war on this, on these giants. And all of the oral legends have been documented and many people have written different books about it, like we can see on the front cover here. This gentleman wrote a book about the red-haired giants living in the caves of Lovelock and Winnemucca. They're, these cannibals were cave dwellers. They would hide deep in the caves. Notice they're just these large, grizzly-looking men. They carry spears, which is very reminiscent of Goliath in the scripture, who carried a spear with a weaver's beam. And just as the picture depicts in the bottom here, the Indians eventually had to do battle with them. And they have some really fascinating legends and lore that date back a long ways. For example, one of the origins of scalping comes from the, these, these battles with these giants. That when they would defeat these giants, they would take a prize. And the prize would be they would cut the red hair off of these entities. And this became such a prominent tradition that according to the chief's daughter... Sarah Winnemucca, seen on the right, they would actually weave the red hair into their ceremonial dresses and pass them down uh, through the different uh, generations. Now, unfortunately, the best we can do is some black and white photography. So it's difficult to say exactly where that's been incorporated into the gown. But the fact that they have all these oral traditions. And one of the things you'll learn about the Native Americans, they're a lot like the Hebrews. They had excellent oral traditions that are passed down from father to son and father to son. They were meticulous in that regard. Now, another interesting uh, legend that we kind of see even in Hollywood is this idea that when the Indians come upon the white man, they would lift up their hand and say, how, white man? And the white man would respond by lifting up his hand. According to the legend, this was to look and see how many fingers and toes that these people had. Because apparently, these giants, according to the legends, had six fingers and six toes. Which on the surface sounds pretty wild until you dig into the scripture and see that we have verses in the Bible that actually confirm this with Goliath and his brothers. So this is what Chief Winnemucca's daughter wrote in her book. My people say that the tribe that we exterminated had red hair, and I have some of their hair, which was handed down from father to son. I have a dress which has been in our family a great many years, and it's trimmed with the reddish hair, and I'm going to wear it sometime when I lecture. It is called a mourning dress, and no one has such a dress but my family. Now that's, that's pretty remarkable. And you can understand that if you were in the Native American culture, and you had to do battle with these huge giants who were literally stealing and eating your tribesmen, that if you could somehow defeat some of them that you would want to take a prize from them as well and what better distinguishing characteristic than that bright red hair and so they would literally scalp these entities and bring their red hair back to their tribe 
to demonstrate their power. And this woman is documenting this throughout the oral traditions that this hair exists inside of this famous dress, a mourning dress. They would wear this dress, and it was a time of mourning where they would mourn the loss of all of their people who waged war with these entities. It's interesting, if you look in the background, you see a female Nephilim with a little baby. We don't hear a lot about the female Nephilim very often. We don't think much about how they were procreating and, and growing their families. But this brings us to the inner breeding, because according to the legends, they didn't only eat the Native American people and hunt them, but sometimes they interbred with them. Just as we see on the far right, the slave of the Sitika. Legend has it that they would kill the men and eat them, and they would take the women back to the caves in order to be their concubines and to turn them into sex slaves. And this brings us back to Genesis 6. We know that it was all about the interbreeding between the sons of God and the daughters of men. And that didn't just stop with the fallen Elohim, but also their hybrid Nephilim children had these same desires. They wanted to eat them physically and drink their blood and also potentially interbreed with them. So we see a story in 2 Samuel 21. As it came to pass, there was a battle with the Philistines and Sibachai slew Saph, who was a son of the giant. That word giant is Raphaim. And there was again a battle in Gob, and this time a Bethlehemite slew the brother of Goliath the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. So we see that Goliath and his brothers were notorious for carrying these large spears or staffs, very similar to what the Native American Paiutes described with the red-haired cannibals that they battled. Those entities carried spears. And we see, continuing on, verse 20, there was yet a battle in Gath. There was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers and every foot six toes, 24 in total. And he also was born to the giant. So again, this, this corroborates what the Native American legends say that these large uh, red-haired giants had six fingers and six toes, which would clearly show a, a relationship to Goliath and his brothers, these same giants that are found in the days of David. And continuing on, these four were born to the, the giant in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and his servants. So... Goliath had four brothers, and we know that in the scripture it says David picked up five smooth stones when he did battle with Goliath. That was a symbolic representation of the fact that he would kill Goliath and his four brothers. And notice that the scripture refers to these giants as men, a man of great stature that had six fingers and six toes and was born to the giant. See, a lot of lay people who don't understand the idea of the Nephilim, they read these different texts, imagining this to be a, a normal human being who's just tall, when in reality we're dealing with something like what we see on the right. A man of great stature with six fingers and six toes, who's born to this, is a son of a giant, is one of these Nephilim offspring. And the Bible just refers to them as men, even as it does back in Genesis 6, when the sons of God and the daughters of men mate 
they bore children who became the mighty men of old, men of renown. These are the Nephilim. They are referred to as men in the Bible. Granted, they're not fully human. They're hybrid men. Now, regarding the specific genetics of these entities, I want to try and throw out a theory here. If we have the Genesis 6 conspiracy where the angels mated with the women, the human women, and they created the 50-50 hybrids known as the Nephilim. From there, over time, the 50-50 hybrids, the Nephilim, if they were to take on a 100% human woman and procreate with it, you would now be diluting the Nephilim gene pool. You would have a 75% human DNA genome with only 25% corrupted Nephilim DNA. And that would be true if that entity were then at some point in the future to mate with another 100% human woman. Again, you would be diluting the Nephilim gene pool. Now you're up to 87.5% human DNA and only 12.5% angelic DNA. And if this process continues over millennia, you can see where the human DNA is increasing and the Nephilim DNA is decreasing. Granted, a little leaven ruins the whole batch. But this would explain how the giants from the pre-flood era begin to diminish in size and some of the physical characteristics are not as prevalent with time so that by the time you get down to Goliath Goliath is approximately a nine to ten foot giant with six fingers and six toes he still has some genetic anomalies but he's living amongst the Philistines he has a lot of overlapping human a human DNA and I would go so far as to say that Goliath probably had a lot more human DNA than he did fallen angelic DNA because with time, we're seeing a genetic dilution effect, if you will, which explains why when you fast forward to a more modern time, we don't see giants roaming around the earth anymore because they're no longer 50-50 hybrids, or at least as far as I understand that. The other thing that you have to understand is that the original Nephilim of Genesis 6 are the true half-breeds. We are using terminology incorrectly today. People throw these words around when dealing with two different ethnic groups in modern times, but in reality, that's not the real etymology of these words. The true half-breed was a half-human, half-angel. They, they were only half of the Adamic race. And then that word has become adulterated over time. This is also true of the word bastard. Today, someone would incorrectly use the word bastard to say, you know, uh, two people get together and, and have a baby out of wedlock and that, that's going to be a bastard. That's incorrect. The real bastard is when the angels took human wives illegally and the children that were born from them were not born under the normal wedlock of a man and a woman. And so they were called bastards. And we see that referenced in the book of Enoch, that the Nephilim are the true bastards. This is the same with the word mongrel. Mongrel comes from the word mingle. It's, it's a mingling of different DNA strains so that you're producing an adulterated version. People, people like Adolf Hitler were, were using terminology like that to, to describe fellow human beings. He was saying that they were a mo mongrel race. But in reality, the mongrel race goes back to the pre-flood era of these true hybrids. This gentleman over here, as if he were a gentleman, this entity over here is a true half-breed, a true bastard, and a true mongrel. He's not fully human. This is also where the word degenerate comes from. Notice it has the root word gene in it. It's a, a de-evolution of the gene pool in such a sense because half of the genome has been corrupted through the fallen angels and so you can see how over the millennia 
this terminology and wording, which really originates back to the true Nephilim, is now being used and applied inappropriately to different ethnic groups of today who are all part of the human race. So I want to move on to the second example. We looked at the Paiute Indians and their ancient legends of the red-haired giants living in the caves of Nevada. Now we're going to take a look at the giant of Kandahar who came from the caves of Afghanistan in 2002. Now this was first introduced by Steve Quayle and L.A. Marzuli, who are two um, authorities on the Nephilim and uh, are, are very uh, credible um, people who documented a story that they received from the military where apparently a special ops task force was sent out in Afghanistan and up in the mountains they came upon a cave and they discovered a 13-foot red-headed, six-fingered, six-toed, double-toothed humanoid who emerged and attacked them in 2002. And they've actually done a rendition of it over here. I included an image for the listeners, but according to witnesses, the giant pierced one of the soldiers with his long spear, killing him. Notice that this entity also used a long spear before the rest of the squad could take him down, shooting at his face for 30 seconds straight. It had six fingers and toes and supposedly had a second row of teeth behind the first. Now, this is another example of the six fingers and six toes, just as we saw in the Bible. Uh, it wore canvas or animal hide on its feet like moccasins, and the body of the giant was packed and loaded into a helicopter and transferred to a secret location in the U.S. for study. The giant weighed about 500 kilograms, as estimated by the C-130 cargo plane team who transported the body to a pickup location in the U.S. Now, 500 kilograms is over 1,000 pounds. But when you think about a six-foot man who weighs roughly, you know, say a six-foot two, 250-pound man, and now you jump up to a 13-foot humanoid-looking man, we're now getting over a 1,000 pounds. The witnesses remember that one of the pilots noted a terrible stench of musk and dirt exuding from the entity similar to that of a cadaver. They said that he smelled like a man who didn't shower for 10 years. And one of the witnesses told Marzulli that the odor was more intense than that of a skunk and close to that of a pile of decomposing corpses. Uh, some of the men they interviewed, one of them by the name of Mr. K, said that it was a monster. It had a red beard with scarlet red long hair covering his shoulders. And Dan was running towards him, firing his weapon. And then all of us came back to reality because the scene was very surreal. From this moment on, it was just the military training that saved the squad and that all of their memories are coming from pure adrenaline. While Dan keeps running against the giant, another soldier opens fire. The video reenactment shows how the giant leaped onto the clearing, pierced Dan with its weapon, and holding him in midair as the point of the spear went through his body, the giant keeps advancing towards the squad. And without any logical reason, each soldier is thinking the same thing. Shoot him in the face! Shoot him in the face! They yell at each other. The unit carried an M4 submachine gun, a 308 recon carbine sniper rifle, and a 50 caliber Barrett semi-automatic rifle. And in 30 seconds, they took this entity down. They said the giant, although hit by multiple bullets, kept on fighting. So... This was actually um, aired on George Norrie's popular radio show, Coast to Coast AM. And it, it's a fascinating story because, one, if it's true, and th th there's a lot of credibility to the story. There's a lot of overlapping details that line up, in my opinion. But, it, one, it's, it's a recent event. It was only 21 years ago that this happened, which means that there are still some of these entities alive on Earth today. We've heard of the Bigfoots and, you know, 
um, the abominable snowmans and all of these different uh, legends that people talk about out there in the in the forests and the caves and in the different reaches of, of, of the deep parts of, of this earth and so um, these entities may still be roaming the earth today but notice some of the similarities in the stories with the Paiute Indians we're dealing with giants we're dealing with red scarlet hair we're dealing with six fingers and six toes we're dealing with entities that live in caves we're dealing with cannibals who they discovered all these bones outside of the cave and we're dealing with entities who are able to effectively use a lance and a spear uh, defensively to and offensively as a weapon now that's a lot of overlapping uh, similarities and qualities which in my opinion uh, makes it a much more authentic story now another example we want to look at is the mysterious red-haired mummies off the coast of Peru and one of the people who have been spent a lot of time researching the different lineages and the archaeological evidence of this is Brian Forrester he wrote a book called Beyond the Black Sea and According to historical records, there was a royal bloodline of the Paracas culture. And within this royal bloodline, only those of nobility, the kings and the queens who were running the culture, they were said to look different. They had, they were taller than normal, they had these elongated skulls, and they had red hair. Now, eventually, the Nazca culture moved in and warred with them and also intermingled with them and eventually were able to exterminate the royal Paracas species. But according to Forrester, the evidence indicates that there's almost a complete absence of elongated cranial skulls during the Nazca period as well as a reduced presence of the red hair. So these these genetic anomalies were bred out over time. Now, in his book, Beyond the Black Sea, he says that the most intriguing characteristic of the Paracas people was their elongated heads. And he goes on to say that it was only the nobility, the, that, that within this culture they had a royal lineage, and it was only the noble ones who had the elongated skulls. And he believes that there was genetic mixing between these uh, royal Paracas nobility bloodlines and regular Homo sapiens. He goes on to say that uh, they had genetically red hair and were most likely light-skinned individuals with green or blue eyes. Thus, thus, they were not traditional Native American types. His recent and extensive DNA testing shows that they very well could have migrated from the Black Sea as far as 3,000 years ago. And he's gone on record as saying that the mitochondrial DNA of these elongated skulls with red hair is not fully human. Now, through their DNA analysis, they believe that they've been able to track these elongated skulls back to the region of Crimea, the Black Sea, and the Caucasus Mountains in this region right here. Well, when you think about it, that's not very far from the land of Canaan. We know that when Moses liberated the Hebrews from Egypt and they made the trek across the desert into the Promised Land, that there were many giant tribes of Nephilim civilizations living in the Promised Land, whether it be King Og of Bashan or the Amalekites, the sons of Anak, all of those tribes were there. And of course, Joshua did battle with many of these tribes and he snuffed out many of these tribes and many of their kings and their, and their royal cities. But he didn't get them all. And so these Canaanite Nephilim tribes migrated out of this area. And we can see that the Black Sea and the Caucasus Mountains are not very far. And as they migrated into these different regions, not only would they sack these regions, but they would also intermingle with 
the people of that area and create further um, intermingling of these different groups until you get a large amalgamations of different genomic mixtures. So this is just another clear example of these tall statured humanoid looking entities who had a lot of human DNA but also had some other hybridized DNA that produced different physical traits and anomalies and they were interbreeding with regular people and creating different combinations of strains. And this explains why all throughout the Old Testament God is constantly commanding the Hebrew race and the nation of Israel not to mix with the pagan heathen tribes because he was trying to maintain that pure Semitic bloodline that would lead to the Messiah. So as you can see, we've given you three clear examples of what appear to be Nephilim entities that have a lot of overlapping qualities. They're all said to be abnormally enlarged men. They're all, they're all gigantic in size. Many of them have red hair. Some of them have six fingers and six toes. In multiple settings, they come from the caves. Many times they're carrying these large spears that they use to uh, wage war on the humans. And in some circumstances, they're even cannibalizing the humans and interbreeding with the humans. And so the question is, is there any further biblical references in the Old Testament that may help shed light on this situation? Now, it may surprise you, or, or it may not, that my theory is that these red-haired giants hail from the ancestry of Esau. And we're going to take a closer look at the birth of Jacob and Esau and some of their differences. But before we do, I, I'm just going to start it off with Malachi 1. Uh, he says that this is the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet you say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and I laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. So in this situation, here we have the prophet speaking on behalf of the most high God. And God is saying that he loves Jacob and he hates Esau. Those are pretty strong words that the Lord is using. And he even goes on to say that Esau's heritage, that's his, his progeny, his legacy that he leaves behind, that it's going to be reserved for the waste of the dragons of the wilderness. He goes on to speak of Edom, which is the lineage of Esau. He says, we are impoverished, but we will return and will build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I'll throw it down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. So we can see that the Lord is attributing all of the heritage of Edom as wickedness and that these are the groups that the Lord will have indignation forever. Now, this brings us to the concept of predestination and election in the Bible, which is a complicated discussion that I don't fully understand. There's been a lot of debate over it over the centuries. I think the only real way that a person can truly understand it is in the context of the Proto-Evangelium of the two different species, the two different races that are that are living on the earth at this time. And, you know, Calvin was a proponent of predestination. He taught a lot about predestination, and there are a lot of Calvinists who subscribed to his teachings. And in essence, he taught that some people were just meant to be saved and some people were meant to be damned. And you know, it was up to God, and, and um, it's kind of like the luck of the draw. God looks down in his creation, and he goes, that guy over there is going to be saved, and that guy over there is going to be damned. And 
a lot of people had a hard time with that notion because inherently it didn't really it didn't seem consistent with God's just nature and but I think where the confusion lies is 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 understanding the proto evangelium and what I mean by that is this we know that it says in the scripture that God wants everybody to come to the knowledge of the truth of the saving grace of Jesus Christ he doesn't want any to be lost granted there's still the doctrine of free will people can can accept or or reject Christ's sacrifice but nonetheless God wants all of mankind to come to the knowledge of, of salvation through Christ and so all of humanity all of those made of the Adamic image all of the human beings doesn't matter what ethnicity you are black white yellow brown all of God's creation he wants them they are predestined to be saved whether they accept that or not is, is a different story but they're predestined for salvation and grace but the Nephilim on the other hand the other race the serpent seed race they are uh, through election and predestination um, prescribed damnation and judgment and hell and when you look at the uh, scripture through that lens it makes a lot more sense and I'm going to try and dedicate a video strictly to this idea of predestination and election and try to pull from some verses in the Old and New Testament that really um, substantiate that it's it's it can only be applied through the lens of the proto evangelium and the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent so Genesis 25 is very important there's some really important details in here that we got to look at when Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren and the Lord was entreated of him and Rebekah his wife conceived if you go back most of the patriarchs their wives were barren because God had a very specific timeline on when they could get pregnant and 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 have children Christ had lots of um, biblical prophecies that he needed to fulfill exactly down to the day the minute and the hour and so God didn't just let these patriarchs get pregnant and have babies when they wanted they were all barren and then they would pray and then when God was ready then he would he would allow them to conceive but the interesting part here is that when Rebecca conceived there were children in her womb plural more than one and the children struggled together within her and she said if it be so why am I this way and she went to inquire of the Lord in other words she actually prayed to God and asked him why is this so difficult what's being insinuated in is that the pregnancy was horrible and verse 22 says the children struggled together within her that word struggled means they waged war with each other that they were at enmity with each other that literally after the moment of conception as they began to grow in the womb they literally struggled and competed for space inside that womb and so this demonstrates this this kind of this concept of the proto evangelium there's two different uh, seeds in this womb that are that are battling with each other now verse 23 says that the Lord said to her there are two nations in thy womb and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels this is really interesting because here the scripture is really going out of its way to show uh, genetic differences in these two two nations are in thy womb that's that's two nation states or two national identities um, also there are two manner of people in thy womb Th this denotes like they're different culturally speaking their mannerisms are different their desires um, the way they act their their, their sort of natural affinity um, is different to different things 
And it, it even goes out of its way to say that the boys are separated from thy bowels. And what that means specifically is um, the internal organs or the inward parts of the womb regarding procreation. And so when you study twins, you either have identical twins who have the same sperm, the same egg, the same DNA, and they're all inside of the same sac, like we see over here. And they're basically uh, identical carbon copies of each other. Or you have fraternal twins that are not identical. They have different DNA going through them. And when you see them, you see that they're separated in the bowel. They have two different yolk sacs within the placenta. Um, th there's a separation between the two of them. And they're not identical. That's essentially what the scripture is, is conveying in this, in this sentence. We got two different national identities, two different mannerisms within these two people in the womb, and they're even separated by the bowels, um, suggesting that they have they're non-identical. And I would imagine that they're kind of uh, one is facing up and the other is facing down, because if you hate somebody and you're in the same womb as them, even though you may not be in the same sack. You're not going to want to be, you know, face to face with them. So either they had their backs to each other and, and, and were turned away from each other, which still sort of represents this law of reversal. Or perhaps one was facing up and the other was facing down. But it's, it's this law of reversal or this as above, so below concept of duality, you know, uh, light versus darkness, good versus evil. Seed of the woman versus seed of the serpent. Now there's a prophecy declared. The one people shall be stronger than the other. And the elder shall serve the younger. And that's exactly what we're going to see. Esau is clearly stronger physically because he's a violent killer. But he's, he's going to end up serving uh, Jacob because Jacob has the blessing of God on him and ends up receiving the birthright anyway. Even though he's not born first, even though Jacob didn't come out first, although had it been up to Jacob, he would have, because as we're going to see here, it says that after uh, Esau came out, uh, Jacob took his hand and he took a hold of Esau's heel, and, and he tried to stop Esau from, from coming out first. The word Jacob means the supplanter. He actually grabbed Esau's heel, and tried to prevent him from coming out of the womb so that Jacob could come out first. There's this, this idea that they're in competition with each other. They don't like each other. They hate each other. This is the true sibling rivalry, and one wants to dominate the other. Jacob tried to come out first, but he didn't. But it doesn't matter because the prophecy has already been declared that even though the older one is stronger, He's going to end up serving the younger. And as we're going to see, Jacob squanders his birthright for a pot of porridge over his belly. And Jacob ends up inheriting the birthright anyway and, and ends up being dominant over Esau. Now, there's a couple more details in here that are real important. Um, as the boys grew, uh, oh, I missed a verse here that we, we really got to cover. When uh, Esau came out, he came out red and hairy all over like a garment. And the scripture is very clear on this. He didn't just come out with, you know, a little patch of red hair on his head. He literally was covered from head to toe in red hair. The word used here is seer, C-R. And it means um, the hair of animals or a garment made of hair. In other words, think about someone who, like, kills an animal and then skins it, and they take that animal hide and they wrap it around their shoulders and their body. That's the word used to describe Esau, that he literally looks like he's been wrapped up in a fur coat. And it also descends from the word disheveling. We never see these words used in the rest of the Bible describing any other person that's born 
Um, not only is Esau hairy, but the word disheveling, it actually means to shiver in dread or to be very afraid with horror at his appearance. In other words, people who look at Esau will actually shiver in dread out of horror because of the way he looks. He's sort of this bent over, rough and gruff, hairy, disheveled man. Which is totally contrast to Jacob, who is a smooth, plain man, as we'll see. And Esau is a cunning hunter, a man of the field. While Jacob is just a plain man dwelling in tents. These are some staunch differences. Um, being a cunning hunter, that connects Esau to the other cunning hunters in the old uh, Genesis account. Men like Nimrod. Nimrod was a, a cunning hunter and a mighty warrior before the Lord. The first rebel king who, who did the Tower of Babel. Um, Tubal Cain was a, was a warrior and a, and a cunning hunter. And so we see that within this geneal, genealogical um, line, if you will, this, that there, this comes to Esau naturally. That the word used to describe Esau is yada. It means to naturally know something, to perceive it, to distinguish it, to be naturally skillful in it. It's almost like instinctual. It's something that can't be taught. Esau is just instinctually a cunning hunter, a man of the field. He's a killer and a hunter and someone who likes to go out, get dirty, get out there with the animals and hunt and kill. Jacob didn't come out like that at all. Remember what the prophecy said above. They're gonna have, These are two manners of people. They're, they're totally different in their mannerisms. Jacob was a plain man who dwelt in tents. The word plain is means like an upright man, an undefiled, complete, whole, sound, and morally innocent man who has integrity, both morally and ethically, which contrasts him with Esau, who was a very immoral man and a very unethically unclean man. And Jacob was a tent dweller. He was a civilized man, or as it says in, in the book of Jubilees, he was a tent dweller because that's where the, school, the, the ancient schools were. Um, that's where they learned the Torah and all of the oral and written traditions of, of God's law and how to read and write and things of that nature. So, so Jacob was a, a learned, intellectual man, if you will. So as hard as it is to receive, this is what I imagine little Esau looked like when he came out. Red and hairy all over. And as the text makes clear, he becomes a, a mighty hunter-gatherer, a man of the field, kind of like this fella right here. And of course, you know, modern day science would have us believe that man has been on the earth for whatever, 65 million years since the prehistoric dinosaur era. And he was a much more primitive monkey type man and through Darwin's evolution he became Neanderthal and these other entities and you know archaeological records show all these different skulls and different uh, differences to the their bones and eventually they led to us but what if in reality these these archaeological records are really just seeing different amalgamations and versions of these ancient Canaanite tribes who all had some different degree of Nephilim genes. And, you know, here in the Bible, we, we have our own account of Esau, that Esau kind of had that Neanderthal look to him. He was a hunter and hairy and disheveled. And in the book of Jubilee, which is an ancient apocryphal writing, they talk about the two boys, Jacob and Esau. Jacob was a smooth and upright man. But Esau was fierce, a man of the field and hairy. And Jacob dwelt in tents. And as the boys grew, 
Jacob learned to write, but Esau did not learn to write, for he was a man of the field and a hunter, and rather he learned war, and all of his deeds were fierce. And so you can clearly see that there is a, a very direct split between these two boys. But either way, at the end of the day, these red-haired giants did exist. We've got archaeological records. We have all these oral stories. And so it's clear that they did persist throughout history. And the question is, where exactly did they come from? Now, we've looked at Esau. He's really the only person in the Old Testament that clearly has these overlapping similarities. I mean, he came out red and hairy all over. He was disheveled. Um, he was a fierce man, a warrior and a killer. He had no desire to follow the ways of the Hebrews or learn God's law. And as we'll see in the next lecture, he ends up migrating down south to Mount Seir, which is known as the land of the hairy ones where he ends up mating with the Horims, and the Horims are said to be these hairy cave-dwelling troglodytes that are, that are basically an ancient Nephilim Canaanite tribe. And the union of Esau and these Horim will give us the Amalekites. And the Amalekites are a wicked group of individuals who God basically declares in the Bible that he wants to wipe out every man, woman, and child. And so on the next lecture, we'll, we'll take a closer look at the Amalekites. But really, it, it becomes evident that there's a, uh, there's a reasonable uh, assertion here that these red-haired cannibals that we've been looking at could very well develop as a, as a distant offspring of the seed of Esau. And if that's true, then my theory would stand correct that Esau does represent the seed of the woman, or excuse me, the seed of the serpent, and Jacob represents the seed of the woman. And on the next lecture, we're going to try and look at how that would be genetically possible. So that's it for today, folks. Godspeed, and we'll see you on the next one.